Sometimes when we're in the midst of hardships and trials, you know, what do we normally do? We can either seek to the things of this world that will leave us empty, or we could seek God and remember, you know what, that he has thoughts for me. He has plans for a future and for a hope that when we seek him, we will be able to find him. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we come before you tonight thanking you. Father, for your love, Lord, thanking you for um, just the joy it is that we can come in here together and just worship you and praise your name, study your word. Lord, and give thanks, Lord. Give thanks for what we got to celebrate last Sunday, Lord, that the tomb is empty and that you are alive. You are a God that is there for us and with us. And as we've been going through this book of Jeremiah, Lord, I pray that you will continue God revealing yourself to us, Lord, drawing us near to you as we study your word. So I pray that you just go before us tonight, Lord, that it'll be your Holy Spirit will be speaking to all of us, Lord, yeah, filling us with what we need to hear from you, Lord, because we all know that, God, we need something from you every day. So just go before us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So I'm pretty excited about tonight. You know, we're just rolling off of, of Easter Resurrection Sunday. Um, I don't know if you guys were there with us at Abravana Hall, but what a beautiful time it was in that building as, you know, as such a large church as this, as we have three services that everybody was able to come and be together as one. And it's it just a, an awesome time to come and, and worship and fellowship and hear that, that that tomb is empty. And as we're digging into these three chapters of Jeremiah tonight, um, it kind of has a little little resemblance of that, you know, on as we're thinking about Resurrection Sunday, you know, Friday was a dark day. Here Jesus was crucified, and then they had Saturday with all of the uncertainty. And we're going to start off going with, you know, with a false prophet tonight, as, as we have for quite a while going through Jeremiah. And then we're going to go through Jeremiah 29, which, which a lot of you may not know Jeremiah 29, but I'm sure most of you know Jeremiah 29, verse 11. It's one of the most popular verses in this book. People have it over in their homes and everything. And it's where it says, you know, I know the thoughts that I think of you, you know, that God thinks about us, you know, no matter what we've been doing, not that he has a thought about us, but he thinks about us. And he has thoughts that are good, not of evil, so that we can have a future and a hope. You know, we're going to be reading that. And that, that going to the people of Judah as they were in captivity. And then we're going to finish off in chapter 30, where it's uh, the restoration of Israel and Judah. You know, we've been going through and hearing about the captivity of Judah, but this one speaks of Israel and Judah. So that one will be a little interesting, but it's kind of like this last past weekend. You know, we had, we had Good Friday where Jesus was on the cross, and then we're going to have these great things in the middle, and then we're going to hear about redemption. And that's what Jesus is he in, here for, for us, for, for our redemption. So let's get started in Jeremiah chapter 28. And it says, And then it happened in the same year, at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah the son of Azur the prophet, who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priest and all of the people, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years, I will bring back to this place all of the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. And I will bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all of the captives of Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord. For I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So here we are, we're a few years into King Zedekiah's reign, and this prophet named Hananiah came out and said, hey, you know what? All of these things that we've been fearing, that we've been worried about, God's going to bring them back. He's going to break the yoke of King Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to bring back all of the captains. He's going to bring back the vessels that have been taken over. And he said, you know what? All of this is going to happen within two years. Usually, you know, if, if you're a prophet of God, you will stand firm on what you say, and you will put a time on it. And here Hananiah is coming in, and he said, you know what? 
These things are going to take place. This is the word of God speaking to me. And you know what? It's going to happen within two years that all of these people will be returning from Babylon. From verse 5, it says, Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to all, to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priest and in the presence of all the people who stood in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform your words which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all who were carried away captive from Babylon to this place. Nevertheless, hear now the word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who have been before me and before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster and pestilence. As for the prophet who prophesies as a peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. So Jeremiah is saying, you know, amen, these things that you're saying are great. You know, praise to God that all of these things are going to happen. But then he says, you know what? Nevertheless, he said, you have spoke in front of all these people, so I'm going to speak in front of all of these people. If we go through, through Scripture, if we look at all of the prophets of old, what did they do? They came, they talked about repentance, they, caught, they talked about pestilence, they talked about war and danger that was coming to them. It said none of them spoke of peace. And he said in verse 9, is that prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, then we will know that the Lord has truly sent him. And he's saying, you know what, you're saying all of these great things, but when we look back in history, when we look at the Torah, when we look at the scriptures of the word of God, all of the prophets that came before us, you know, they all were speaking of judgment. None of them were coming and speaking of peace. So in verse 10, it says that then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke off of the prophet Jeremiah's neck and he broke it. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all of the people saying, thus says the Lord, even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. So if this thing was true, that would be great. You know, the last week we talked about Jeremiah walking around with that yoke because the Lord told him, hey, take the yoke and go and preach to the people that they need to yoke himself to the king Nebuchadnezzar. You know, go ahead, surrender, go into captivity, and you will have, you know, you have peace. You guys will survive. And here Hananiah, he comes and he grabs that yoke. I don't know if he broke it over his knee or how he broke it, but I just envision, you know, snapping it over his knee and saying, look, I have broken the yoke from Nebuchadnezzar, that within two years, all of these people will be coming back. All will be all back, one big happy family. And Jeremiah heard it, and it says that he went away. And then in verse 12, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, You have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made it in their place yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him, I have given him the beast, the beast of the fields also. So he's telling him, you know what, you, you did something. You broke this yoke of wood, you know, but now you have caused them to have a yoke of iron, something that man cannot break. And when we were reading last week, we were talking about all of the different nations around them that, you know, they were trying to, to team up with. Maybe if we gather with these people, we'll be able to defeat Nebuchadnezzar. But he's saying, you know what, I'm putting this yoke not only on Judah, but all of the surrounding nations too, that they will serve King Nebuchadnezzar and also all of their beasts of the field. So he's going to come in and he's going to have complete control of everybody around him. And then he said in verse 15, Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but you made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cast you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. So Jeremiah felt very, very important to address this in public. You know, Hananiah was saying all of these things were the priest, were the people, everybody could hear. And he said, you know what? You were speaking 
lies. So guess what? The Lord has said this year, because you have taught rebellion against the Lord, that you would die. You know, God doesn't want people coming around and speaking to his people false hope, false truth. You know, over and over we've seen Jeremiah for the last 30 some odd years telling them, you know, they need to repent, that judgment was coming. And then they had this prophet Hananiah telling them, you know what, in two years, everybody's going to be home, we're going to have a big party, we're going to be back to normal. And he said, you're telling my people to trust in a lie. And then Hananiah, as he deceived these people, Jeremiah did something as well. You know, just as Hananiah said, within two years, everybody's going to be coming back. He said, within this year, you shall surely die. So in verse 1, when we were at the beginning, it said in the fifth month that um, Hananiah came onto the scene. And here we see that Jeremiah prophesied that he would die later that year. He died two months after Jeremiah was speaking to him. So within the, the two years that he said people were going to come back from captive, within two months, God has taken his life. And then as we drop down to chapter 29, um, you know, as we were singing that last song of worship, you know, draw me near to you, draw me close to you, Lord. Help me find my way back to you. You know, this chapter we're going to read is, is a letter written to to those that, that are in captivity. It's kind of like a love letter, a reminder from God, just as we worship and sing praises of asking God, draw us back to him, you know, keep me close to you. Here we had all of these people from Judah that were taken captive. You know, they, they came in, they took, they took Daniel, they took everybody that was going to be worth something. They took the tradesmen, they took those that, that were smart, those that were, were healthy, and they brought them to Babylon. And I'm sure as they were sitting there in Babylon thinking, you know what, why, why are we here? You know, all of our other people are still at home. They have, it, they have it good. And then God had brought us over here. Why was that, Lord? And then as we go through this letter, we'll see what God's thoughts were. It says in chapter 29, verse 1, now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This happened after Jeconiah the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the smith had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasha, the king of Stephan, and Girmah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. So we're reading in here, and we're, we're seeing that this is a letter to those that were taken away. And it says that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, he came in, and he dragged everybody out. He carried them away. But when we get to verse 4, we said that it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all of you who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away. So it's a letter saying, you know what, you guys are, you're over here in this foreign land. You think that it's something from Nebuchadnezzar, but I want you to let you know that I have caused you, I, the Lord, have caused you to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. And then it says in verse 5, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives and beget sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished, and seek the peace of the city that I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. So he's telling them, you know what, you guys are in captivity. And I want you guys to, to build houses. I want you guys to plant gardens. I want you guys pretty much to set up shop. I want you guys to go out, get married, have kids. Plan on your kid getting married and having kids. And when you're in captivity, you're thinking, you know what, Lord, we're waiting to go back home. You know, we could see what's going on at home that, 
that King Zedekiah is still on the throne, Lord, that we would like to go back home. But he's saying, you know what? You're going to be here for a little while. And that's what he says, you know, in um, Genesis when we saw the people being enslaved in Egypt, you know, to, to build, to multiply, to grow. And that's what God wants us to do. You know, here we're looking at the people of Judah. They are in a foreign land. And when we look at, at our lives today, when we look at ourselves, you know, the Bible says that, that we are not of this world. We are here in this world. We are here to, to occupy. We're here to marry. We're here to have kids. We're here to, to do business. We're here to have um, praying for peace for our land. You know, as we're reading through the Old Testament, we could tie it in so much with the New Testament as well as, as God says that while you're in this land, I want you to pray for the peace in this land. When we go to the New Testament in Matthew, Jesus tells us to be the salt and the light of this world, that where we are, you know, it's not our home, but we're supposed to occupy, we're supposed to live, we're supposed to, to grow, to marry, to have kids, to have grandkids, and be fruitful, but we're supposed to impact the area that we're in. It doesn't say that, you know, you guys are in captivity just to lay down and die and give up. He's saying, no, you build yourself a house. You know, a house means something that is going to be solid, something that you would call, you know, your temporary home. You're going to be going home. You're going to take care of your house. You're going to take care of your kids. You're going to be taking care of your garden. It's not going to be something that you're going to be here temporary. When we drop down in verse 10 in just a minute, you know, he talks about being there for 70 years. When we go through Psalms, it says that, you know, our life expectancy is 70 years. You know, maybe by strength you might get 80. So I was Googling today, you know, this was written a long time ago to see what is the average life expectancy here in America today. And it's 76 years. It's a little bit more than 70, a little bit under 80. But just like in this time when they were in captivity for 70 years, it was like a life sentence. You know, we have been given a life sentence here on earth to, to occupy, to grow, to live, to be a part of the community that we're in. You know, these guys were taken to Babylon, and he didn't say, you know, to isolate yourself, to surround yourself in a little bubble. He's like, be a part of the community, be praying for the community, be growing stuff, be living, be working, be a part of the world that is around you, and be ready for when I return. Because he says in verse 10, for this says the Lord, after 70 years are complete at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good words to you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And verse 12 says, and then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all of your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all of the nations and from all of the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried captive. So, you know, when we're going through difficult times, as these people were in Judah, it says, you know what? I'm thinking about you. I have not forgotten you. And we got to remember why they were driven into captivity. You know, over and over, the prophets were coming. They were telling them that they need to repent because they were worshiping idols. They were following other gods. They weren't paying attention to, to Jehovah. They weren't pretend, paying attention to, to Yahweh, their God. They were looking and searching after other gods. So God said, I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to bring you out for what seems like a lifetime. For some of them that went into captivity, they, they died. But for their kids and for their grandkids... It says, when you seek me, you will find me. So here they were. They were in captivity. They didn't have their idols. They were focused on staying alive. They were focused on building their homes and, and living as it says. But God reminded them, you know what, that my thoughts are for you. You know, his thoughts were for them. Here they are in captivity, and God's telling them that, you know what, I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking thoughts of peace and not of evil. And if you're sitting in prison or if you're being a slave in another land, you're like, you know, this does not feel like peace. This feels like thoughts of evil towards me. But while they were there, their hearts changed. You know, they started seeking the Lord. They started searching for God. You know, sometimes when we're in the midst of hardships and trials, you know, what do we normally do? We can either 
seek to the things of this world that will leave us empty, or we could seek God and remember, you know what, that he has thoughts for me. He has plans for a future and for a hope that when we seek him, we will be able to find him. And it says in, um, in Psalm 40, if you're wondering, you know, does God really think about it? David said, ponder the thoughts of God upon his people. He said, for your thoughts towards us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I were to declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. You know, God has more thoughts about us than we could even number. And I'm looking at it, you know, looking around all the creation and just, just how cool it is right now with a little bit of snow in the mountains and the green grass. And to think that the God that created all of this, even if he thought about me just one time, would be amazing. But not only does he think about me one time, he's thinking about me an innumerable amount of time. He's thinking about you an innumerable amount of times. And in Ephesians 2.10, it says that not only does he think about us, it says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He created us for a purpose. He had thoughts for us. He had purpose for us. He had plans for us. And here these people are in captivity, in a foreign land, wondering what is going on. But yet, God is reminding them that I'm thinking about you, that I have plans for you. And in verse 15, he says, Because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon, therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David, concerning all the people who dwell in the city, and concerning the brethren who have gone out with you into captivity, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send on them the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and we will make them like rotten figs that cannot be eaten. They are so bad. And I will pursue them with the sword, with the famine, and with the pestilence. And I will deliver them to trouble among the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, an astonishment, a hissing, a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Because they have not heeded my word, says the Lord, which I sent to them, to by my servant, the prophet, rising up early and sending them, neither would you heed, says the Lord. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all of the captivity who I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon. Oh, he's reminding them, you guys, you guys are seeking to be like those that are in Judah, those that are under King Zedekiah. He's like, you know what? They're going to be getting all of this heartache. They're going to be getting the sword. They're going to be driven out. They're going to receive pestilence and famine. And he says, I will deliver them to trouble among all of the kingdoms of the earth. So God's saying, you know what? My thoughts for you are good. I have brought you here to Babylon to protect you from all of the wrath that will be poured out on the rest of the people of Judah. And in verse 21, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Coliath, and Zedekiah, the son of Messiah, who prophesy a lie to you in my name, Behold, I will deliver them into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. And because of them, a curse shall be taken up by all of the captivity of Judah who are in Babylon, saying, The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. Because they have done disgraceful things in Israel, they have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives and have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them. Indeed, I know, and I am a witness, says the Lord. So here he is in the letter speaking to, through Jeremiah, and he addresses a couple different individuals. He spoke of Ahab and Zedekiah, two men who were prophets named after wicked kings of Israel and Judah. And apparently among them, they, they lied to the people, telling them that, Nebuchadnezzar's weakness and soon restoration of Judah to the Jews. But not only were they wrong generally, they were wrong regarding themselves personally, and they would soon be executed by the king. You know, God does not take kindly to people speaking falsely in his name. And it wasn't just that they were executed. It sounded like it was a, a horrible death, that they were roasted in the fire, and everyone could see what was happening to them. So God was a witness to them that, you know what, these are my words. These are what are going to happen. And in verse 24, he says, You shall also speak to Shemaiah the Nehalamite, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, 
the God of Israel, saying, You have sent letters in your name to all the people who are at Jerusalem, to Zephaniah, the son of Micaiah, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, The Lord has made you priest instead of Jehodiah, the priest, so that there should be officers in the house of the Lord over every man who is demented and considers himself a prophet, that you should put him in prison and in the stocks. Now, therefore, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah of Anathoth, who makes himself a prophet to you? For he has sent us into Babylon, saying, This captivity is long. Build houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat their food. So the second message, it was Shema the Nephilite, was saying that, you know, he's sending letters to the high priest, saying, Why is Jeremiah being able to say all of these things? You know, he's saying that we're going to be in captivity long enough that we should go and build homes long enough that we should plant gardens long enough that we should take up root in this town. He said, you know what, we got all these other prophets saying that, that peace is coming, that it's going to be a short time. So why is Jeremiah allowed to say what he's saying? And in verse 29, it says, so now Zephaniah the priest read this letter in the hearing of Jeremiah the prophet. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, send all of those in captivity saying, Thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah the Nehemite, because Shemaiah has prophesied to you, and I have not sent him, and he has caused you to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah the Nephilite and his family. He shall not have anyone to dwell among his people, nor shall he see the good that I will do for my people, says the Lord, because he has taught rebellion against the Lord." So when the letter from Shemaiah came to Jerusalem and Zephaniah heard it, he was reading it and they were criticizing Jeremiah. You know, nobody wants to be told that you're going to be in captivity long enough that, you know, most of you are going to die, you're going to have children, you're going to have grandchildren, and they're going to be raised in captivity. But God directed Jeremiah to respond with it, saying that, you know what? Zephaniah is not going to have any kids, that his whole family was going to be punished and would die without seeing the people get freed from Babylon. And then we'll drop down to chapter 30, the restoration of Israel and Judah. The word that God, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I have given to their fathers, and they shall possess it. So we just got a letter written to the people why they were in captivity, that you know what, you're going to be here for a little bit, go ahead and build your home, build your gardens. And now he's writing another letter, and the first part of it at the beginning, it says, the word came from Jeremiah and the Lord, saying, thus speak the Lord of God of Israel, saying, write for yourself, coming to Israel and to Judah. So at the beginning, you know, they, they split. Israel has already been taken captive for 150 years. Part of Judah has been captive. They haven't had their 70 years yet. But God is speaking to both of them, saying that he's going to bring them both out of captivity and return them to their land. And in verse 4, it says, Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice trembling of fear and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins, like a woman in labor? And all faces turn pale. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is a time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So here he is, the Lord saying, you know, I hear all of this moaning and groaning. I see all these men with their hands on their loins like they are in a woman in labor. Now, you know all of the jokes of, you know, a man gets a, a little cold and it wipes him out completely. He can't handle the flu. He can't handle anything because they're a bunch of big babies. And here God's saying, you know what, why does it sound like they're a woman in labor? I could not imagine ever being in labor, but just a picture the agony and the pain of a man in labor. And that's what God's saying. He said, why do they sound like a woman in labor? All of their faces pale, no color 
is in their face, and it says, Alas, for the day is great, so that none would be like it. So Jeremiah is using similar words of coming judgment, coming judgment that, that no man has seen. And it says, in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's very similar to the wording used for, for um, the time of the great tribulation because it says that none shall be saved out of it. And in verse 8 he says, For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck, and I will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will rise up for them. So he's saying that day is going to pass when, when all of the bonds will be broken from the next. You know, we, we look at this captivity. They're going to come back into Judah. They're going to come back into Israel. But when we read in Jesus' day, you know what? They're still enslaved. They're under Roman control. But he's saying right here that there will be a day where no one will enslave them. And they shall serve the Lord their God. And David will be their king whom I rise up. You know, different commentaries talk about this a little bit differently, where it could be the line of David, where it'll be David as um, the Messiah, Jesus from the lineage of David. But he's talking about a day when, when the Jews will not be enslaved anymore, when they will have peace. All of their yokes that have been on their neck will have been broken. You know, when we look at the book of Revelation and we look at the millennial kingdom, it says that, you know, we will be ruling and reigning with the Lord here on earth. So it's very possible that it says, whom I will raise up for them, David, as their king, is that David will be ruling and reigning in Jerusalem as we rule and reign with Jesus as well. And in verse 10, it says, Therefore do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, and be quiet. And no one shall make him afraid, for I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, Though I make full end of all the nations who have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end to you. But I will cor correct you in justice and will not let you altogether go unpunished. So God's saying, I'm going to save you. I'm going to save my people, but the troubles, the, the, the things that they've gone through, you know, they're still going to face tribulation. They're still going to face judgment. He said, I will not let them go unpunished because we have a God that is, is righteous. He is holy. He cannot look on to sin and just dismiss it. You know, if there is something going on, God has to deal with it. And he's saying that I will not let you go altogether unpunished, but they will be redeemed from their captivity. They will return home, says the Lord, where he will save them. And in verse 12, he says, for thus says the Lord, your affliction is incurable, incurable. Your wound is severe. There is no one to plead your cause that you have been bound up. You have no healing medicine. All of your lovers have forgotten you. They do not seek you, for I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one. For the multitudes of your iniquities because of your sins have increased. Why do you cry about your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable because the multitude of your iniquities. Because your sins have increased, I have done these things to you. So as they were in captivity, as those that were still remaining in Judah, you know, they weren't heeding the prophets. They were still worshiping the idols. They were still following the false gods of the neighboring lands. And he said, why are you guys continuing to plead your cause? You know, you guys are crying out to me, yet you're doing the things of your own heart. You're following the desires of your heart. You're not seeking the Lord and he says, you're crying about these afflictions that you have brought upon yourselves. And he said, because of the multitude of your sins, because of the multitude of your iniquities, your sins have been increased, and I have done these things to you. And in verse 16, he says, therefore, all those who devour you shall be devoured, and all of your adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall become plundered. All of you who pray upon you, I will make a prey. For I will restore health to you and heal your wounds, says the Lord, because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion, no one seeks her. 
You know, God said, I'm going to deal with you guys. But then everybody that came against you, I am going to devour them as well. They will be in the captivity. We see Nebuchadnezzar, he's going to come in. He's going to rule and reign over them. And then they're going to get wiped out as well. Because God is seeing this. And no one has called you an outcast because this is Zion and no one seeks her. God just said in the last chapter, he said, you know what? I know the thoughts I think of you. I am not going to give you a future that is evil. I'm going to give you a future that is good. I will restore you. And in verse 18, he says, thus says the Lord again, behold, I will bring back the captivity of Jacob's tent and have mercy on his dwelling place. The city shall be built up on its own mound and the, plate, the palace shall remain according to its own plan. Then out of them shall proceed thanksgiving and the voices of those who make merry. I will multiply them, and they shall not diminish. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Their children also shall be as before, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all who, press, who oppress them. You know, God is, is emphasizing that he's going to bring restoration. You know, this whole time in captivity, you know, you're told to dwell, you're told to plant, you know, it seems like, you know, this is going to last forever. You know, when we look at our lifespan of an average of 76.7 years, you know, being in captivity for 70 years would be a lifetime. You know, if we were to go and get arrested and the, the judge gives us a sentence of 70 years, for most of us in here, that would be like the death penalty. But that's what they're thinking, you know, why are we in here for so long? And God's saying, I'm going to bring back the captivity of Jacob's tents. And he said Jerusalem would never remain dead or an unoccupied city. You know, they're going to be coming in and wiped out by King Nebuchadnezzar, but he's promising that it will never be dead or unoccupied and that God will build and restore it. You know, if you were to go to Jerusalem today, it's a thriving city, and yet they're still waiting. You know, they're still planning so when they can rebuild the temple. And in verse 21, he says, their nobles shall be from all among them, and their governors shall come from their midst. Then I will cause him, to draw, cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. For who is this who pledged his heart and approached me, says the Lord? And in verse 22, he says, You shall be my people, and I will be your God. You know, in verse 21, he's talking about the nobles and the governor who should come from their midst. And who shall be able to approach me? Who should be able to approach God? And who is able to pledge his heart to approach me? You know, when we look through the scriptures, when we look at this earth, who is the one that loved God more than anybody here that walks this earth? Who is the one that could cause to draw near him? You know, verse 21, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the Messiah that is able to, to pledge his heart, to approach God, because you and I, you know, it says that we have the mediator of Christ Jesus so that we can come to God. And here it is, Jesus can approach him. And then in verse 22, how precious is that? Not only to them, but to us today. It says, you shall be my people and I will be your God. And in verse 23, it says, behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury. A continuum whirlwind. It is a fall violently on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it, until he has performed the intent of his heart. You know, the whirlwind is a figure of God's judgment coming in like a tornado. You know, we can't control a tornado. We can see and look at the destruction of the path that the tornado went through, but there's nothing that man has that we have on earth that will be able to control a tornado. It's like a whirlwind of the Lord, a whirlwind of the Lord who goes forth. It falls violently on the head of the wicked. But his mercies, they may long delay it, but they're certainly going to come. You know, his anger will not return until he's done it and he's performed it. But in the latter days, he says, one expression for God's love is his displeasure for evil. You know, as we're looking at these people that are being taken captive, he promises that, you know what, those that came against you, those that have brought you into captivity, those nations around you, God says that they're all going to be devoured. They're all going to be taken into captivity. 
And when we look at the, these three chapters that we went to, we look at the, the outline, the description of them. In verse chapter 28, you know, it's the false prophet comes in telling lies to the people. Chapter 29, we see God's promises and time of redemption spoken to his people to live and to occupy while you're in between your homes. And in this last chapter of verse 30 right here, it's talking about, in chapter 30, it says, you shall be my people and I will be your God. You know, there's this time of being in the middle. As we, if we just finished celebrating Easter, you know, it was, it was a time of being in the, me- in the middle. We have what they call, you know, the, the quiet Saturday. You know, this time of occupying, this time of grief. And as we're going through Jeremiah, we can see that our lives, an average of 76 years, you know, that we're here, we're not of this world, but we're occupying. We're supposed to be doing the things that that God has commanded us to do. And we saw in uh, Ephesians that he said, you know, he created us for a purpose, for his good work. So why we're here occupying this land that, that is not our home. Because, you know, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us that we are are kingdom-minded because we are waiting to go home and be with our Savior. And during that time, how are we going to work? How are we going to fulfill what God has asked us to do? You know, this is our in-between. This is our, our middle time that we get to live our lives. You know, that God says that if you were to seek me, like, I will draw near to you. Where you seek me, you will find me. And I really love verse 22 in chapter 30 where it says that you shall be my people and I will be your God. So as we go through this book, we study the hardship. We study all of the judgment, all of the captivity. As God brought his people out, the cool thing is, is that, you know, as we finish Jeremiah, as we see that they have been taken captive, and as we read a little bit about today, is that when they return you never see or hear about the people of Israel turning to idolatry. You know, they may have their other sins and, and devices that they've fallen into, but they have never gone back to idolatry, worshiping other gods. And it is so cool to see that God said, you know what, 70 years. I'm going to take you out for 70 years, and then I'm going to bring you back. And we're still waiting for that day today when the Messiah comes back, where he lives in that millennial reign where David will be sitting on his throne ruling over Jerusalem. And who knows, maybe some of you will be ruling over some lands over here in Salt Lake City or wherever God has us. But we have that future. We have that hope. And we know that we have a God that is thinking about you continuously in the middle of the trials, in the middle of the hardships, in the middle of the celebrating, in the middle of the weddings and the grandchildren and the kids. God is thinking about us. And he's thinking thoughts that are of peace, thoughts of joy, not of evil against that. So when we're going through things, we need to remember that we can always trust that God is thinking about us. And that it says in verse 22, that you shall be my people and I will be your God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are our God. Lord, we thank you that you have chosen us to be your people. But it's so much than just being your people, Lord, that you love us, that you are continually thinking about us, Lord, thoughts that are good, not of evil, for a future and for a hope. And God, as we're praying today, Lord, I pray for everybody in this room today that they have hope. And Lord, if we listen to your word that you are thinking thoughts of us for hope. So God, if we are losing hope, if we are lacking hope, God, I pray that they will seek you. God, that you will draw near to them to remind them that you call them my people and that you are our God. So, Lord, I pray that you just go before us this week, Lord, that you draw us near to you. Lord, that you remind us that you have created us for a purpose, for good works. Because not only do you think about us, Lord, that you love us. God, you love us so much that you sent your son to die for our sins so that you can be our God. So go before us this work, Lord. Lead us, guide us, give us wisdom in all that we do. Lord, let us be a people that are kingdom-minded, Lord, even though we are here for a time as this, Lord, that we will be thinking of you and be used by you. 
In Jesus' name, amen.